Now I'd like to invite another colleague from CCI who used to work in our division, uh, the Preservation Services, but now she's with Heritage Interiors, and she's going to be talking about uh, the Parliament's center block uh, collections move project. And so, Tanya Matis, <laughs> thank you. Uh, again, um, my name is Tanya Modis, and I'm a conservator in the Heritage Interiors Division at CCI. Um, I'm going to talk today on our project, uh, which we've entitled, for the purpose of today, a balancing act, preparing to move, store, and protect Parliament center block art and artifact collections. So uh, my presentation today will primarily describe is this good? Okay. Uh, the methods and tools I employed in order to determine storage facility space needs as part of a long-term capital plan. Um, I'll start by introducing our client in this work and by describing the parliamentary precinct's long-term vision and plan, which includes the rehabilitation of the center block of parliament. I will describe the project, the project management framework within which we are working. I'll also present some of the, oops, some of the tools um, and, oh, sorry, just one second. Back here, yeah, I'm just, so, uh, making things bigger so I can see. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Sorry. So there we are. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So I'll set the context by describing the long term vision and plan, which includes the rehabilitation of the center block of parliament. I'll describe the project management framework within which we are working. I'll also present some of the challenges of this project, how we attempt to manage these challenges by balancing the needs of our client and the needs of the project. Uh, so the parliamentary precinct is a term used to describe the geographical area in downtown Ottawa that contains all the Crown-owned buildings occupied by the Senate of Canada, the House of Commons, and the Library of Parliament. This includes Parliament Hill and the Gothic Triada building. So this is the West Block, the East Block, and the Center Block with the Library of Parliament at the rear. Uh, the Center Block is the international home of Canada's system of parliamentary democracy. The sponsoring organization for the CCI's work is the Parliamentary Precinct Branch of Public Works and Government Services of Canada, or Public Works, or PWGSE. Um, they're the ones who manage the day-to-day -day maintenance of the buildings. They're, they're like the landlords of the buildings, where as the partners, the, the parliamentary partners are the tenants. Uh, the Heritage Conservation Directorate is part of the Center of Expertise for Public Works, and they provide specialized architectural and engineering services to federal government departments. And then, of course, we have our key active stakeholders in this work, and they are known as the Parliamentary Partners. They are the Senate of Canada, House of Commons, and the Library of Parliament. So Public Works is currently undertaking a major program to preserve and rehabilitate these historic buildings. They must be restored structurally, modernized to current standards, um, and rehabilitated to provide functional parliamentary and visitor facilities that meet the t technical expectations of this 21st century. Uh, so work to these buildings include exterior rehabilitation, so repair of damaged masonry, windows, sculptural components, as well as seismic upgrades, and then interior restoration, and so that's um, mostly electrical, mechanical, and life safety systems uh, to, to meet code and keep the buildings operational for years to come. Uh, we at CCI are also, of course, advocating for the stabilization, repair, and reinstatement of historic finishes of these buildings. So in, in order to provide a coordinated approach to this work, Public Works established what is called the Long-Term Vision and Plan, or the LTVP, or some of us call it the Long-Winded Plan. But <laughs> So the LTVP is essentially an implementation strategy and it's composed of a series of rolling five-year plans over a 25-year time horizon. 
But first and foremost, um, the plan covers the renovation of the core parliamentary buildings up here. And then you can see that the renovation of center block takes us to 2028. One of the prime milestones of the LTVP is the rehabilitation of center block, which cannot be renovated while occupied. So existing crown-owned buildings will be renovated um, within the vicinity, these crown-owned buildings, and retrofitted to accommodate the displaced debating chambers of the House of Commons and the Senate on an interim basis. And further, the entire Library of Parliament staff and main collection will be relocated as well. Um, the advancement of the LTVP will also have a significant impact on art and artifacts. So heritage items that are not fixed to the building um, must either be moved to new locations within the precinct for continued use, so in the chambers for instance, or be put into temporary storage. Uh, we estimate this to be approximately 9,000 art and artifact objects, um, which includes heritage doors, uh, furniture, light fixtures, balustrades, paintings, stained glass windows, to name a few. So when center block is closed in 2018, we expect about 80% of the heritage collections to be in storage. So our role uh, uh, with uh, this project, the services of the CCI have been engaged uh, to perform what are called pre-design studies for the rehabilitation. And a major component of this is to, ve to develop a move management plan for the displaced art and artifacts with defined storage facility space needs and operational requirements for the duration of the 10-year project. Um, these studies then feed into a public works project management framework. Um, so for now, we are at the feasibility stage of the project preparing Class D estimates which are then used to seek preliminary project approval from the Treasury Board. Um, I think what's important to note here is that at this stage it's generally accepted to have estimates with an accuracy of plus or minus 15 to 20 percent. So uh, determining Class D storage facility space needs for these 9,000 displaced art and artifact objects means uh, that we are deriving a gross footprint, so a meter squared estimate. And this time, instead of that 15 to 20 percent, it's actually elevated to 25 percent just because of the complexity of the project. Um, this footprint is then converted into unit cost per meter squared, and that's done by someone outside of us. Um, <laughs> but, at, so, but at this stage, it's important to have a clearly, clearly stated assumptions, omissions, and gaps in our analysis stated. Um, so where to begin? In order to accomplish this, we first completed a comprehensive inventory of public works art and artifacts in 2013. Um, before then, there was no record. Public works didn't have a record of what they were actually responsible for. Um, and with that information, we developed an interim database to hold all of that information. Uh, the parliamentary partners, their, for their part, they provided draft estimates of their projected material going into storage, as well as draft operational requirements as well. But um, because of the variances in inventory data in terms of format, um, a level of detailed information from these stakeholders, developing a footprint even even a gross footprint with this level of contingency at this stage uh, was not a straightforward task. And multiple estimation methods were required. Um, and I'll describe three of what I used next. So uh, the first method I used for the bulk of our inventory data, um, art and artifacts were grouped into three general categories, such as doors or light fixtures. And then dimensions were averaged for each grouping of general object type. And where necessary, these groupings were subdivided further. So for instance, light fixtures were divided into oversized, large, and average. 
from the average dimensions, um, multiplicative factors or coefficients were applied to account for. Uh, first, protected packing of the objects. So a factor of 1.25 was used for protective crating, padding, and wrapping. Then, uh, safe object access. So a factor of 1.3 was used for access around the packed objects, um, including the space that storage furniture occupies, such as vertical posts, um, clearance between the objects. Um, this is a number adapted from a Sue Walston and Brian, Brian Bertram method in their 19, 1992 paper, uh, estimating space for the storage of ethnographic collections. And then third, uh, circulation. So a factor of 1.75 was used for circulation around the storage space itself and for object retrieval, assuming that machinery such as forklifts would be necessary. And this, uh, that method is, that number is taken from the reorg method. So here, here are the light fixtures, um, subdivided into average, large, and oversized. And then from their average dimensions, have multiplicative factors applied successively. So first here for the protective packing to, to, to determine the gross footprint, or to determine the footprint of each packed object. So this is packed length times, pa times packed width gives us our packed footprint. From the packed footprint, factors are then applied for safe access. For, and then for circulation and object retrieval. Then to determine the total gross footprint, it was decided that realistically most of these objects would then be stored, would likely be stored on shelving units, at least two maybe, and, and likely three layers high. So it is also seen that, but it is also seen that there will be instances where uh, objects will not fit this model, and so we'll have special cases for them. So that's just one of the assumptions that we have to state with our estimates. So the next method I needed to use was for framed artwork. So the storage space requirement for framed artworks stored on racks was estimated using a method uh, developed for a course in storage management um, by ECROM in 2003. Uh, this method involves first determining the total surface area of all paintings in the collection with a 10% buffer for handling and hanging. Then the number of racks needed to accommodate all the framed works is determined by estimating the maximum size of racks that would be installed in the intended storage space. And so from this we calculate the rack surface area. And then finally, calculating the floor surface area required to accommodate these racks and their arrangement, because there's different ways you can arrange them based on if they're mobile or fixed and what arrangement you have for the mobile racks. Uh, to simplify the process, I grouped the framed artworks into three general categories. So paintings, prints, drawings and photographs, and then oversized paintings and worked with the maximum dimension in each. So generally speaking, um, uh, there were a few outliers in, term, in each category in terms of, of dimensions. So most of them fit a typical dimension and so that, that just simplified the process. Um, so again, 10% is added for the handling and hanging. So 10% is added to the surface area of the artwork. And then required rack surface area is the buffered number times the quantity of artwork. So 80 paintings times the 2.46 meters squared. So, that, so that's our required rack surface area. So, and then surface area per rack. So um, this number was determined from what we know is currently used by the parliamentary partners for their small collection that they have in storage right now. Uh, so once we had that number, the number of racks required uh, was derived by dividing the required rack surface area by surface, rack, surface area per rack. And then finally, uh, the floor space needed for the racks is the number of racks times their known dimension. And then last but not least, the gross footprint, so what our client wants to know. 
Uh, the gross footprint is, a, is accounting for an arrangement of mobile racks known as one half plus one half or one half rack plus one half free space for you to be able to pull out the rack and, and retrieve the painting from the rack. Um, the third method I used was by far the most straightforward. So the approach is based on simply applying a growth, a predicted growth factor to a current, current storage layout and the number of art and artifacts. So this effectively compares the existing space to an anticipated space requirement. Um, the one downside, however, to this method is that we are assuming that the current storage space is appropriate, so not over full. And actually also the, another downside is that it's an assumption that we're gonna be employing the same, a similar fit up strategy as they're currently using. But, uh, so what was done here was um, the collection was divided into general types, so furniture, fine art, and artifacts, and by fit up, so shelving, pallet, panel, flat storage. The growth factor was determined by dividing the ante anticipated number of new objects coming out of the center block and going into storage and by the number of items currently in storage. The anticipated area required is then the current area occupied by these objects currently in storage, and this includes aisle, fit up, et cetera, multiplied by this growth factor. So from the sum of all of these estimates, you might be wondering why I had to use all these different estimates. Uh, I'll get to that in a bit. But from the sum of all these estimates, so the final storage space projection for the center block art and artifacts was determined to be about 5,725 meters squared, about half the size of a Home Depot or a Costco warehouse. Um, but there are many stated assumptions with this estimate. We don't fully know the scope of the project. Uh, there may be a requirement to store much, much, much more material than what is estimated here. It is also with the assumption that many of these objects will be palletized and stored on racks uh, three layers high. But at this stage in the project, we have a sense of the magnitude of the number of objects requiring storage and the area necessary to store them. And so at this stage, uh, that's good enough. Uh, for certain, the planning of any major move of art and artifact material is a massive undertaking, but if I had to describe the overarching challenge of this project, a balancing act would aptly describe it. Uh, the significance of the building itself makes for a balancing act it is Canada's most iconic landmark. It's the apex of Parliament Hill and the image of our nation. Um, for many Canadians, it has come to hold a measurable cultural value over time. And as a designated classified federal heritage building, we, have to, we, we are mandated to comply with Treasury Board policies to reduce risk damage um, of damage, loss, or theft to these crown-owned art and artifacts. Uh, so we are balancing conservation goals with the needs of the overall rehabilitation project and the necessary, often interventive, uh, construction work. Uh, and in general, while the art and artifacts are in good to fair condition, the unstable condition of some is to be expected in an operational building of this age. So most of the condition issues re relate to um, an unstable in indoor climate, inadequate maintenance, and a lack of continued conservation care. Um, we seek a museum standard for the art and artifacts, but this must be pragmatically balanced with the needs of a day-to-day -day operational building. And I, I found this picture yesterday morning that made me laugh. So this is um, a, a, a fireplace surround and mantle that is currently being used with a, so someone put their desk in the middle of the fireplace. So, so anyway. Uh, um, and, then, and then, of course, we are also balancing the needs of public works with those of key stakeholders, so balancing potential conflicting objectives of different parties. Um, within its walls, functionally distinct areas are integrated, the debating chambers of the Senate and of the House of Commons, as well as the offices of a number of senators, member of, members of parliament, the prime minister, and senior administration for both legislative houses. 
is also the location of several ceremonial spaces and public spaces as well. So, I mean, it's a project that requires a heck of a lot of diplomacy and we can't be insensitive to our stakeholders, but we have to keep the project flowing. So when stakeholders give us data that doesn't necessarily fit the model that, that we are working with and that are, is easiest for us to work with, we, we uh, can't do a whole lot about it. We need to just keep the project flowing and be diplomatic about it. Uh, so uh, to conclude my presentation, a brief mention of the next steps of this project. So the results of these pre-designed studies, so these um, class D estimates, will then be used to help aid a design prime consultant once that contract has been awarded in 2016. Uh, these estimates will continue to be refined by the consultant leading to the overall project approval. Um, and in the meantime, the construction or the retrofit of a building suitable for storage is on the critical path for the center block rehabilitation project and must be ready well in advance of project implementation in 2018. So it's a, it's a really tight timeline. Um, and I just want to thank all my partners in this work and to thank uh, Reorg Ontario for and the Brant Museum and Archives for hosting us. Thank you. So if you need space calculations and storage, you know where to go. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I, I think the reason why Simone uh, invited me here is because these tools, I mean, they, it, it, I wasn't using rocket science to derive these, and it's a project with a, a very big budget, but it's tools that um, many of us have used before, and, 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 it, and it gives good enough estimates to take it to just that project approval stage. Is it is it 50,000 objects, or is it 5,000 objects, or is it 500 objects? And that's, that's, so there's tools out there to be able to get to that to that point in the project. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tanya. Thanks. <laughs>